Hey guys, this is James. And this is Denny from TDB bringing you guys episode 170. And today we are talking about Red Poor T Basics. Yep, so gonna go a little bit uh, into the history, some brewing. But before that, um, what teas are we brewing here, Denny? We have a young and a old uh, ripe. This is a 2014 Yunnan sourcing. Year uh, of the horse. Year of the horse. Shout yep. out to May. My yep. homie's uh, do this this way. Daughter, born then. And then uh, I actually didn't get to take a look at the other cake that you brought out, the older one. Yep. So that is the uh, uh, '90s cake I picked up in Taiwan that had spent some time in Hong Kong. So uh, it's a uh, it's it's a different sort of tea uh, because it has some age on it, um, but uh, still, you know, it brews up dark and stuff like that. Uh, so those are the two teas that we're going. We just kind of want to illustrate the difference of a couple different types of teas, uh, ripe teas that you could have. Mm-hmm. Um, but before that, I think we're going to get a little bit into uh, the history of ripe. Uh, so, um, yeah, and so I'll just start off by talking a little about what makes ripe ripe versus raw yeah. raw. Um, ripe poor is basically the same thing as raw pu'er insofar as it's a pressed tea that's fermented and aged from yunnan from yunnan but what's different is that <clears throat> excuse me is that uh raw pu'er is left to its own devices in terms of how the microbial um and fungal you know basically environment affects the tea over time whereas ripe pu'er is uh sort of basically um Factory farmed, <laughs> in essence, it's a, uh, it's purposefully um, inoculated. Uh, I believe would be the right term with um, this specific strains of bacteria that will, in a specific environment over a specific amount of time, again, kind of factory farm tea um, that will, as a result, uh, cause the fermentation process to be dramatically uh, accelerated. Yep. Um, and uh, this is going to give it a very different character. Yep. As a result. And so that process that Denny's talking about is historically, of course, there are variations of it done in about 45 days. Uh, some of the bigger factories will sort of treat it like a guarded secret uh, to some extent. Um, but uh, I guess probably the simplest way for us as Westerners that have not done the process, presumably, or seen the process happen... Right is uh, to think of it sort of as like a version of composting um, where uh, the they have their raw material uh, which is very similar to raw pour in some sense and then they are exposing it to a lot of heat and a lot of humidity for about 45 days and usually for the reliable good ones they will then uh, let that air out for quite some time before they actually sell it uh, but uh, we all have heard of the ripe pour stank or wadwe, uh, which is uh, what you can happen if that pour is sold, especially early. And uh, it's a very, it has been described as people as like fungal, fishy, and just generally not pleasant for most people. Uh, and uh, so that can be a reason to wait for uh, these ripe pours to age a little bit. Totally. And that, that funk can get... Um brewed away from the tea yep so often we'll do two rinses as a result of that yep or even three if it's particularly stanky (laughs) very true so but in terms of the history of ripe you know why was ripe Mm -hmm. created james yeah so uh it was created in the 70s by the head of the kunming tea factory tea factory number one Mm -hmm. and the Menghai dai tea factory factory number two um sort of as a result to satisfy the demand for um, raw pour to uh, places like Hong Kong, uh, other communities in Southeast Asia where pu'er is traditionally sent to. Mm -hmm. And those communities tend to prefer more pu'er that sort of brews up this color, so more fermented, fully finished pu'er. And of course, you can't create that overnight with raw pu'er. Raw pu'er is processed to be greener initially. Um, So they uh, could not, they wanted to satisfy that demand, and so they came up with this process uh, in the early 70s, I believe, uh, called uh, ripe pour, cook yeah. or shoe or show, 
which essentially means cooked in Chinese. Yeah, absolutely. So literally, demand for tea itself sort of accelerated the process. Um, and uh, as a result, we have ripe pork. But as it turns out, even though the actual functional tea is very similar, the characteristics of the tea, the flavors of the tea, do differ dramatically, and so very, very much so. So the the a young ripe is going to be so different than a young raw pour, um, and a old raw will change far more than an old ripe. Um, exactly. T- more typically, generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, there aren't super old ripes out there because it's just a new technology, um, more or less. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, um, the character of these teas do. Uh, transform um, over age as well. So, let's give this a uh, drink, James. And I okay. think this is the young. So if my horse. smell is correct, yep. Then yeah, this is uh, young and potentially still a little stanky. Mm-hmm. Let's give it a shot. And so this tea, we've probably been a little bit unfair to it because it has stayed in this baggie for a while, right. which probably hasn't reduced the stank as much as it would have otherwise. But cheers. Cheers. Mm. A little bit of the stank. It's not actually overpowering. It's really creamy. Yeah, very creamy. <clears throat> it lingers. There's a little bit of stank in the aftertaste, I feel like. A little bit of funk. Mm. Nice. Yum. And then we're going to do this old... And what was the age, the year on this red? Uh, I don't have an exact year, but it is 90s. And it was described to me when I bought it as ginseng. Huh. Interesting. Cheers. Cheers. So, actually, both of these ripes have a very creamy consistency, a really thick, viscous consistency, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, the, the, the first, which is the younger one, I think is a little bit more fruity. The latter is a little bit more earthy, a little bit more branch, um, sticky, (laughs) leafy. Do you think you can taste the age in the second one? I do, yeah, Yeah. entirely. I think you can also just smell the age. I didn't actually know which one you were picking, but just just from the cup smell alone, it's just really abundantly clear. Um, Now, of course, if you never ever smelled the stuff, it might be hard to tell, but just, yeah, it's just just, oh, it's really nice finish, uh, sort of a hint of coffee bitterness in there, but... Sweet, smooth, thick. Yeah, the young... Specifically, Young Ripe has this really, um, gosh, I want to just say kind of expansive, um, deep smell and a lot, often notes of cherry, um, dark cherries, chocolate, um, can sometimes be creamy, Yep. but you're not usually going to get roasted flavors, you're not usually going to get, um, highly, uh, crisp high mountain flavors. Um, you're not going to get a lot of fruit that's going to be different than those those small pitted dark fruits. Um, so what other characteristics in terms of the flavor composition, James, do you think Ripe has that differs from Raw Pour? Why do I bring this next one up? Um, you know, I would probably mainly echo things that you said. Um, uh, definitely... Ripe will veer towards dark color versus a light one. Uh, you're gonna not have like sort of those crisp floral notes that you could get from raw pour early on, at least. Um, and sort of like those darker, earthier, uh, some would say dirt like. I, I usually don't describe it like that. Um, uh, smoother, uh, more rounded. It should be easier on the stomach as well. Mm-hmm. Um, notes to it. Yeah, totally. Raw tends to have um, smoky, petrol, peaty, mm-hmm. yeah. um, earthy flavors to it, and, and I think a lot of higher notes. Yes, it can be. I think there's more variety in raw pour, um, mm-hmm. which I think is one reason people are drawn to it. There's also sort of this sort of mystique about raw pour compared to ripe, where raw can age. You can find really old raw pour cakes. Whether or not they actually taste good is a whole other thing, but. There's there's a longer history. It's sort of like ripe pour is the Americas and uh, raw pour is uh, Europe. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of history and architecture and 
uh, other metaphoric things that make sense to you as an audience viewer, even though James is giving me a skeptical mm-hmm. look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, so let's talk. We're going to transition and talk about how to brew this stuff. Yeah, let's do it. And, uh, yeah. Benny, so you have been brewing these in the background. We have not talked about how you're brewing. Uh, what, how, what's what been your style for this? Mm-hmm. Uh, how many rinses mm-hmm. uh, and why? Yeah, totally. So Gong Fu style is what I tend to do with this, uh, with ripes. Um, rinses, usually two. And that's usually going to be because you're going to have some stink on there. Let's be real. Um, the tea will just be a little bit dirty too. And, you know, as I've said multiple times on the show... You can also just get more quickly to the actual tea that way. Yep. Um, so that's one more reason to do it. Maybe if you have a really prized ripe um, and you know the monkeys that picked it, then <laughs> you, you only need to do one rinse. I only buy tea <laughs> where I know the monkeys that picked it. <laughs> um, in terms of the actual gram amount here, I don't know if James actually weighed it out at all. I did. Uh, okay. Five grams for 75 milliliters. Okay, great. So. Um and, it, and it, I think the rule of thumb, excuse the expression, would be um, filling the guy wand at the bottom full with three to five chunks, maybe having a little bit more than the bottom of the guy wand full, but something like that. Now, this will vary dramatically based on compression. So if you have a stone-pressed tea, first off, it's going to take longer to get into the tea, and yep. um, it'll be deceptively small when it starts as well. But if you, for instance, have... On the contrary, uh, one of like those tool chas, the right. shaguan tool chas that Danny likes, that are actually very compressed, uh, then that might take a little bit longer to come apart. Yes. So something yes. to something take like in that. consideration. That in that sense, it is somewhat similar to raw pour or other compressed teas. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And those the pressing the I don't know what you would call it the pressure with which teas are pressed will influence the aging process as well. Um, so, but. In terms of brewing parameters, typical brewing parameters, and it's going to be uh, up to your preference and taste, Mm -hmm. ripe is going to be more forgiving than raw in general. Um, So you'll be able to fudge it up a little bit, but with this much tea, um, you really don't want to brew very long. Mm -hmm. It'll get to be this like black syrup quickly. You can just see even the leftover tea water in the cup is just dark pitch black yeah Yeah. and so when would you start to increase the steep times beyond just like sort of flash infusions yeah probably after the sixth steeping okay so Um, you can go pretty short for a while yeah yeah definitely i think the thing that you'll notice first that you're losing is the viscosity of the brew Mm -hmm. and that will be a good signpost to say okay let's either reheat the water or give it a little bit longer time yeah makes sense yep Cheers. One of my favorite parts about raw, I'm sorry, about ripe is is the creaminess yep. and the getting lots of that now. The sort of vanilla bean flavors that come often with it. You took the notes right out of my mm. mouth. Uh, really nice. Anyways, one thing I was going to add uh, as far as like small little brewing things that you can think about is there are a couple different types of ripe. A very popular type of ripe is the very tippy, buddy one, small leaves. Mm. Um, so gong ting, uh, things like that. Uh, and those ripes will tend to brew out faster. Uh, just because you can get a little bit more surface area. There are also coarser in leaf varieties. Um, 8592 is a famous dye recipe uh, where the leaves are very big. And those will brew out, um, they'll be a little bit more robust to start. Uh, and they won't brew out quite as fast, but they may last a little bit longer mm-hmm. as a result as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, Red pour is often paired with <clears throat> your dim sum at, in, at the Chinese restaurant. Um, it's pretty uncommon to find elsewhere, unless you're kind of a tea person, I think. Same thing with raw, of course. Um, mm-hmm. So, but it won't be, it's not going to be in your local um, grocery store. <laughs> um, it might be at your local Asian market, maybe. Well, you could buy it at, you, maybe you could find it, but even then, it, it's fairly sketchy, I would say. Yes. Uh, and I think, where would you recommend someone, if someone was interested in buying Ripe Poor? Yeah. Would you recommend them against going to maybe those grocery options and stuff like that? Totally. Um, I think 
I think that for introducing yourself to Ripe and Rob, who were, um, and I would probably put, well, most tea in the same category, <laughs> go to a tea house and try it um, and have uh, someone who's been drinking tea a long time pour mm-hmm. for you. It's always fun to just socialize and learn more about tea. Um, uh, or just sit there and just go, mmm, mmm, and not talk at all. <laughs> it happens sometimes, too. Um, so I would I would definitely stray away from um, going to any sort of popular grocery store to do yeah. it. Um, Even Asian markets can be fairly dicey for ripe poor. Yes, yeah, 100%. If you, if you actually want to drink it like this. 100%. Is. Some good um, resources online. Check us out on tdb.org. Yep. Um, we have great information there about where to buy um, ripe. Yep. Hard not to give a shout out to Scott at Unon Sourcing just for the variety of ripe. Yep. It's definitely the place that I started drinking ripe. Yep. And I, I think one of the other nice things about ripe is it need not be expensive to get pretty good tea. So uh, I think I would echo what Denny said. And I also say that, you know, if you're not by a tea house or uh, if you just don't want to go to a tea house, right. which is totally fine. Uh, I would recommend checking out a specialist in Poor. I think the tea quality for Poor, especially that you will find, will be significantly better than your general uh, tea house on most instances, mm-hmm. such as you non sourcing as, right. uh, as as Denny has said, and uh, still very affordable too. Hardly any difference in price, if not even cheaper potentially. Definitely, yeah. I mean, you can find big bings for. 10 to 20 dollars that are perfectly decent um so ripe poor uh more so than raw poor i think is very forgiving on your wallet Mm -hmm. and can be a very economical drink to drink at least functional decent teas yeah 100 percent what are some characteristics that people are going to notice when they um get older versus younger ripe and are there recommendations that you have for aging ripe poor Ooh, that's a that's a that's a good questions. Yeah, uh, age can definitely play some factor. Um, one new thing, one other type of ripe is there can be lightly fermented versus more heavily fermented. Teas that are lightly fermented intuitively will develop more. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Scott has a green miracle cake or something like that um, from the previous year that uh, is a lighter fermented tea and will probably improve over, you know, five or ten years. Mm -hmm. Uh, So those teas will tend to improve with age. There's also a very big difference between sort of drier storage, like that one brick that we reviewed ages ago, um, as well as sort of like Hong Kong storage, like this tea. Mm -hmm. Um, So there there's certainly some sort of difference like what like here we can definitely taste more of the age characteristics right and that brick that we had actually is quite unique in the sense that you get sort of like smoky red date profile hmm. yeah. um so it can vary uh and the age definitely can play some impact but uh less so than raw poor for instance mm. Really tasty. Um, in terms of storage, folks, there's going to be virtually no difference to how you're storing your raw versus your ripe. The one thing you would want to keep in mind is that you might want to store them apart from each other in separate mm-hmm. areas um, or separate containers. Yep. And that's just because you're going to have some adulteration when the actual the, the smells and flavor profiles yeah. are very different. It's not going to totally ruin it, but right. it will affect the, especially the aromatic experience, I think, from for both of the teas. Yeah. Your, your raw will smell a little bit like ripe, and your ripe might smell a little bit like raw. Yeah, and it might just be the outside of the tea, the first steepings on the outside of the cake or the brick that you have, and then as you get farther in, it won't be as bad. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> other things to keep in mind, too... Um, is that ripes in general are going to get to 80% of their flavor profile through age far more quickly than a raw will. And so, in my opinion, they tend to be better to be drank early. Mm-hmm. Um, not immediately. You want to give them some time, of course. Um, but if they've been stored and, and if they've been um, aged in a humid environment for three or four years they're probably pretty much ready to rock and roll. Um, it's always fun to drink old raw, I'm sorry, old ripe, excuse me, um, but you'll be, the differences between an, a five-year-old ripe and a 10-year-old ripe 
are going to be far less than the difference between yep. a five-year-old raw and a 10-year-old raw. Yeah. So there is definitely a school of thought, uh, kind of like what Denny is saying, where people tend to regard old ripe as maybe like a poorer value proposition than uh, older raw, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are some other common questions that folks have about uh, ripe, James? Um... I don't, I mean, we've kind of touched on this, but I feel like uh, people will talk about that fishy thing and mm -hmm. how to avoid it. Everyone on, like, the T Reddit will, like, post up, like, a really sketchy being. It's like, my dad's dad's cousin got this from China, <laughs> and he knew I liked tea. And it's, like, a really generic thing. It's like, it kind of tastes like stinky feet. And it's like, well, yeah. Um, so, I mean, usually it's better to go to your better sources for tea. Um, but really, for a lot of the cheaper ripes, you got to just air that out, give it time, set it aside for a couple of years, and then come back to it, and it might improve significantly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that if you want to get into tea, um, and you'd like to expand your palate beyond just, let's say, J.D. Oolongs or um, black teas, maybe you're into green tea, ripe pour is a very inexpensive way to get a very different flavor profile out of tea. Um, and to experience this category, which frankly, ripe and raw, <clears throat> they they share similarities, but from a taste perspective, they they differ as much as oolong uh, as a roasted versus a jade oolong. Um, they just have a dramatically different flavor profile, um, and yes, they follow the same processing and they follow similar processing, but nevertheless, you're going to get a radically different experience of the actual flavors yep. um, as mm -hmm. well. So. Uh, I think that might cover it. I don't know. What I think so, too. Say? Yeah, I was trying to think the same question, but I think that covers it. Let us know what we missed. We may be back for, for part two uh, for our Lord of the Rings edition of Ripe Pour. <laughs> Director's uh, Cut? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Director's Cut? Yeah. The, the first video is like 20 minutes, and the second video is like three hours yeah. and 55 minutes with like Maybe the only thing commentary. we were missing is, uh, is uh, dressing up in costume. <laughs> It has elves or, or oh, some God. shit like that. Anyways, uh, where can someone find out more <laughs> about tea, Danny? Check us out on tdb.org, T-E-A-D-B dot O-R-G. Um, support all the vendors out there who are bringing it raw to, uh, bringing it ripe, excuse me, to our doorsteps. So um, there are plenty out there. Check us out on tdb.org to find a list of great places to go and buy ripe from. Follow us on YouTube if you want more videos. And uh, <laughs> if you like this video, please like the video. Yeah, please do that. Um, and otherwise, uh, just stay tuned for more um, tea reviews, tea content, and so forth. Like everything that you possibly can. Give us all your money. And we'll talk to you guys next time. Cheers. <laughs>